So, uh, good evening. Welcome to the Radical History School for October. Uh, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Simon Cocker. Uh, Simon uh, first appeared in my life when he brought a choir over to the Toll Puddle Festival and they performed a folk opera. And Simon and I have remained uh, friends since then. I've been to Tasmania to visit him in his hometown and uh, worked with him uh, over the years. So, it's a great pleasure to have him presenting for the Radical History School tonight. Uh, he's very keen on the, uh, the history of George Lovelace in uh, Tasmania, as you're about to discover. And it's my great pleasure to hand over uh, the Toll Paddle Radical History School to Simon Cocker, all the way from Tasmania. Right. Thank you, Les. It's, uh, and good evening, all. It's a very great pleasure to be presenting to the Toll Paddle Radical History School again, this time from Hobart. Right, so my topic is Lovelace in Hobart Town, and it examines the 879 days that he spent in Van Diemen's Land out of the 1,205 days that passed between his arrest in February 1834 and his return to England as a free man in June 1837. Particularly look at four of the documented incidents that Lovelace wrote about in his victims of Whiggery, and which received attention in the media, government records, and the British Parliament of the day. Uh, there is meeting and interrogation with Thomas Mason, his appearance before Magistrate William Gunn, the invitation to bring his family to the island, and the schmozzle around granting of his uh, uh, pardons, various pardons that he's given. It all starts in Hobart Town, but why Hobart Town? Well, Hobart sits in the southeast corner of an island now known as Tasmania, nestled at the foot of Kudanyi, Mount Wellington. It sits in the Southern Ocean, straddles latitude 42 degrees south, and is Australia's southernmost and its smallest state. The moderating influences of the oceans and the Great East Australian current means it enjoys a cool, temperate climate. In size, it's very similar to Ireland. More than 40% of the island is preserved uh, in pristine forested state under World Heritage Protection, and a further 10% is preserved as national parks. The island's also known to its original inhabitants as La Truita and has an uncertain ancient history. Evidence of habitation 40,000 years ago has been found, but the evidence of continuity is sparse. Originally, there was a land bridge to mainland Australia. Uh, it was submerged at the end of the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. Bass Strait formed to be one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world as the Indian Pacific and Southern Oceans collide. The indigenous people of the island lived in isolation for many thousands of years. The first known interaction with Europe being the visit of the Dutch explorer, Abel Tasman in 1642. It was he who named it Van Diemen's Land after his sponsor, the governor of Batavia. The island was visited sporadically until the end of the 18th century when it started to attack, attract regular attention from both British and French explorers, including William Bly, James Cook, Bruni Don Castro, and Louis de Freycinet. It wasn't recognised as an island until 1798 when Bass and Flinders undertook their famous circumnavigation. But the fact that it was an island and was attracting visits from the French raised territorial concerns in Sydney that led to the decision to make a settlement on the River Derwent and secure the territory as British in 1803. After a few months, the settlement was moved to Sullivan's Cove and Hobart was founded. A second settlement was made on the north coast in 1806, but with its sparse native population, estimated at only eight to 10,000, and its relative isolation, it was very well suited as a penal colony and it grew quickly. Eventually, more than 40% of the 160,000 people transported to Australia were sent to Hobart Town. From the 1820s, three settlers arrived with the expectation that land grants would be made to them. And the best available land was the grassy woodlands that had been fire farmed by Aborigines for thousands of years to create grazing lands for their kangaroos and wallabies. This was the beginning of conflict as not only did sheep push kangaroos off the grasslands, but the settlers treated the grasslands as God's gift to themselves. And they started to refuse to allow native passage along their ancient highways. And that ill will was exacerbated by the mistreatment of native women and children. Colonel George Arthur was appointed Lieutenant Governor in 1824. It's said that he was a brilliant administrator who laid the foundations for modern Tasmania. It can also be argued that his regime was brutal and used favouritism, nepotism, bribery 
and severe secondary punishments ranging from exile, flogging and hanging to achieve his ends. He was, in, he was confronted on arrival by the large numbers of emancipated men and convict escapees who were living lawlessly in the inland and the distant coastal areas and also the growing resistance of the native population. The era of bush ranging was brought to an end through the hunting down and hanging around about 260 individuals, while the black problem developed into a full-scale war, where Arthur, while paying lip service to British protection of native lives and rights, did nothing to protect them and indeed privately approved the capture or killing of natives to clear the settled areas. By 1832, the last of the combatants reached agreement with Arthur to accept temporary banishment to the Bass Strait Islands. So by the time George Lovelace arrived, the island was basically devoid of its native population. Hobart Town was a thriving port town, servicing whaling, sealing, wattle oil and agriculture. At that time, there were an estimated 800 houses in the Hobart area and the grand sandstone houses and cottages that characterise Hobart today were just starting to appear. But for all that, it remained an open prison under military law. So back to George Lovelace. Day one of this affair was February 24th, 1834. George Lovelace and five others were advised by a local constable that a warrant had been issued for their arrest for administering an unlawful oath. Little did he know that this warrant was the result of weeks of plotting between the Home Secretary and the local landowner and magistrate, James Frampton. Day 21, he was tried. Day 24, sentenced to seven years transportation. George Lovelace was separated from the others and he alone was sent to Van Diemen's land. In the words of the famous Queen's Counsel, H.V. Everett, he had suffered injustice within the law. On day 40, he was transferred to the Hulk York. And on day 82, the ship William Metcalf departed from Portsmouth for Hobart Town. It had 240 male prisoners on board, 12 passengers, Naval Surgeon, Captain Phillipson, 28 crew, two officers and 29 rank and file soldiers, including Ensign Arthur, the son of the governor. The William Metcalf itself was on its first major voyage, having been built in Sunderland and launched that year. The voyage was down the Atlantic Ocean, around the Cape of Good Hope, down to the Roaring Forties and across the Southern Ocean before turning up towards Van Diemen's Land, into Storm Bay and then 30 odd miles up the Derwent River to Hobart Town. Theirs was a relatively quick journey, 102 days. In fact, of the 124 previous transport sailings, only two had been quicker. The journey was direct and relatively smooth with no life lost among the 240 prisoners on board. In his dispatch acknowledging its arrival, in fact, Arthur praised the performance of the captain and the surgeon. Although Lovelace was listed in the surgeon's journal as having pneumonia, who arrived in Hobart town on the sick list. Also arriving on the same day, despite leaving 20 days earlier, was the prisoner transport, the Edward. It's likely that this ship attracted greater attention in Hobart Town, as it had 151 female prisoners on board, enough to make a small change to the ratio of men to women, women in Hobart Town, then three to one. His first impression of Hobart Town was not favourable, as he viewed it from the harbour. Its appearance is not very inviting, he wrote for a considerable part of it seems to be lost in a flat betwixt the harbour and Mount Wellington. He may also have been unimpressed that they sat in the harbour for five days before any attempt to begin disembarking. Disembarking involves processing. A clerk records a range of details that would serve to identify the prisoner if required. So that is the record that they took of George Lovelace. He was prisoner 848, which would have been the 848th prisoner processed in, nine, in 1834. Uh, it lists his trade as a ploughman. He's a native of Dorset. Uh, he was five foot four and a quarter inches tall, which was just on average height for a man in the 1830s and, and slightly shorter than the average height for a rural man in those, age, in those days. He was aged 37. And then there's a, a complete description, uh, which the constables would have to rely on if George Lovelace went missing uh, and they had to find him. And then and finally, he, he had uh, a small scar on his upper lip and a scar on his left arm as identifying marks. The conduct record was the second document that they commenced at the time. 
Again, you can see this prisoner 848, George Loveless, he got his ship, William Metcalf and his date of arrival, which is the 4th of September. Although we do note that in his note, he wrote it was the 3rd of September, but it's just a day different there. Uh, the Dorset Assizes, 14th of March, 1834. In the, in the red, it says that he was transported for administering unlawful oaths. His jar report was unknown. His hop report was good. He's married with three children. Stated his offence was administering an unlawful oath after he became a member of a trade union. And again, it says he's married with three children. Wife Elizabeth is at the native place of Dorchester. Dorte and finally, the surgeon's report was orderly. Those, those three reports, the jail report, the, the ship report, the surgeon's report, were all quite important documents uh, when assessing the, what they would do with uh, prisoners, where they'd be assigned, and, and, and when it came time for tickets of leave and so on. The next part uh, talks about uh, an appearance before Magistrate Gunn in November 1835. And according to this, uh, George Lovelace received a reprimand. It then goes on to say he's holding a ticket of completion from every penal observance by order of His Excellency via memo of Colonial Secretary, 3rd of February, 1836. And we'll come back to that. Then it lists his two pardons, the conditional pardon for May, 1836, and the free pardon of October, 1836. He then faced uh, what can only be called an extraordinary interrogation from a colonial official, official by the name of Thomas Mason, who insisted that Lovelace knew of a plot for the uprising of unionists all across England and demanded to know the starting sign. He threatened Lovelace with further punishment if he didn't reveal all. Lovelace, according to his account, stoically denied all knowledge and advised he could not divulge what he didn't know. The next day, he wrote a note that ended up in the records held in London. It's filed away with 60 odd petitions from all over the UK calling for the release of the Dorset labourers. It documents his arrival, describes his interrogation by Mason and notes his impending re relief at being separated from his voyage companions. The convict manifest shows that 51 of them had life sentences and about one in four of the prisoners were from London or Middlesex jails, probably not men of Lovelace's normal acquaintance. But a clue to the note's final destination can be found uh, in the August the 9th, 1836 edition of the Colonial Times. An article re re repeated from an unspecified English journal reported that the Dorset Committee had sent a delegation to Lord Russell in early 1836. And they were treated with some scepticism when they complained about the treatment of Lovelace on arrival. The delegation provided the Home Secretary with a letter supporting their claims, and I think it's probably this one. Following that, a dispatch was sent reminding Governor Arthur that he should not interfere with trial decisions made in England. Undoubtedly, Lovelace wasn't making himself welcome with the, the local officials. But on September the 12th, he was finally landed and he's marched up through the town to the penitentiary where he was paraded before Governor Arthur. Arthur initiated a conversation with Lovelace and again raised issues about his wrongdoing and the supposed union uprising. Lovelace's responses as reported by himself were stoic and brave. He denied knowledge of an uprising and refused to admit that he had wrong, acted wrongly when he could see only that he had acted to prevent the starvation of his family. He could not accept that the breaking of an obscure law he knew nothing of was breaking the law. And when pressed by Arthur to acknowledge he had done wrong and should be sorry for it, he replied, I cannot do this, sir, until I see it. The next day, he was summoned down to the police office where Mason again questioned him on the issue of the union uprising and what Lovelace knew, knew of it. I have told you, sir, all I can. It appears you know more about it than I. And again, Lovelace was verbally abused by Thomas Mason and threatened with further punishment. So a little bit about Thomas Mason, as he was sort of a central character in a lot of this. 
He was a controversial figure in the Connolly, in the colony, where many believed he was neither suited to nor worthy of high government office. He was born in 1800, and after an education limited by the early death of his father, he joined, he joined the mercantile firm of Heath and Furs Silk Merchants. He lost his savings in a bank crash and was encouraged by his brother-in-law, George Franklin, the Surveyor General in Van Diemen's Land, to emigrate. He arrived in Hobart Town in December 1829. He lived for a time with his brother-in-law, George Franklin. Then he was made a Justice of the Peace. In March 1831, he was appointed Assistant Police Magistrate and Muster Master in Hobart. Quite a significant uh, senior position in the civil service and one for which he had no qualifications or training for other than perhaps um, connections because the master, 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 master's duties were chiefly to maintain the complicated system of conflict records upon which the efficiency of the penal administration largely rested. But it was also his responsibility to keep the registers under various categories of the free population on the island. And as assistant police magistrate, he was expected also to assist in the trial of convict offenders. His appointment was noted with some sarcasm uh, by the Cornwall Chronicle the tongue-in-cheek quote reflects what many were thinking. But, uh, the way they put it is, of course, that it wasn't an appointment based on nepotism because his excellency had too much good sense to do that. But uh, certainly that's what they're all thinking. He was regularly involved in scandal. In 1832, Arthur set him to, to investigate perceived irregularities in the counts of a highly restricted, respected magistrate of 18 years service, a guy called James Gordon. No irregularities were found except for the failure of the governor to forward soldiers' wages in a timely manner. However, Mason's manner and the spurious allegations he raised led to Gordon's resignation. And by coincidence, he was uh, immediately replaced by the governor's private secretary who had recently been made redundant by Whitehall. Uh, in 1834, the long-running Greenwood scandal had its origins. Greenwood was an abs absconded convict who was spotted at the Newtown racetrack, and he was pursued by constables, one, who, one of whom was cut across his face in the struggle. Greenwood was taken before Mason, who sentenced him with the words, you will receive a hundred lashes, then be handed over to the Supreme Court, where you will be found guilty and no doubt hung. It was seen as very harsh to flog a man before hanging him and very inappropriate for an assistant magistrate to preempt the Supreme Court. So when the 22 year old Joseph Greenwood was subsequently hung several days later and his back was still raw and bleeding, this was seen by many as barbaric, even for Van Diemen's land. So Mason lost credibility with many in the colony uh, and it got worse as he at various times denied ever saying those words, despite a number of reliable witnesses saying he did. The conflict about his integrity, including uh, slander trials and other uh, public arguments resulted over the next 18 months. He appeared to have the strong backing of the governor, governor and the executive right throughout the whole process including being granted a second slander trial after the first one found against him. In November 1835, Mason was appointed as a magistrate in New Norfolk, which led to the resignation of some of the existing magistrates and a refusal of all others to sit with him. This created a particular issue in September 1836, when the annual licensing hearings were firstly postponed for two weeks as it required two magistrates to sit and collect the fees and issue the licenses and significant delays on resumption when Mason insisted on attending despite not being required as the magistrate had been ordered up from Hobart town for the sittings. Uh, and then this quote uh, comes from the Colonial Times, admittedly not a friend of Governor Arthur's, but uh, he criticises that appointment uh, and refers to the fact that the community hates the man. One of Arthur's last acts was to appoint him as barrack master in New Norfolk, whereupon the officers stationed there resolved to pay him no attention. He was, it would seem, 
a vain, aggressive, litigious individual who was widely disliked, but one with patronage and strong support from Governor Arthur and the executive. But strangely enough, he may have been a sit of assistance to the loveless cause. I'll come back to that. A factor in influencing the way that Lovelace was treated may have been awareness of the growing political sensitivity in London uh, on, on the whole issue of the treatment of the Dorset labourers. Of course, any information from London came by boat, meaning delays of four to five months were normal. For example, on August the 14th, 1834, the Tasmanian advised its readers that they had intelligence up to April the 27th due to recent boat arrivals. This was just 21 days before George Lovelace arrived, only three days before the five others landed in Sydney. And of course, included the first reports uh, on the case of the Dorset labourers. This will also apply much the same to the governor. He learned of the whole affair of the arrest, the trial, the hasty transportation, as well as the new, numerous reports of public meetings, petitions to parliament, uh, the beginnings of the parliamentary debate and the mighty demonstration at Copenhagen Fields just a few days before Lovelace arrived. The TUC's 1934 publication described London as being like an armed camp. And these reports may well have created an atmosphere where Arthur and his minions saw Lovelace in a false light uh, as, as a rebellious leader of an uprising, leading to the questioning and the threats. However, the forthright non-stances given by Lovelace appear to have positive consequences. The first of these, that Arthur decided that far from deploying Lovelace in irons on the road gang, as he'd been sentenced, he would send him to work on the government farm. It should be noted that the government farm formed part of the governor's allowances, so that the produce and any profits from the farm accrued to Arthur. Truly, it was in his best interest to assign the best available labour to the farm, suggesting that Lovelace had made a good impression. He had to spend a week or two at the penitentiary where he was said to sleep without a bed or blanket and was suffering from the effects of wearing irons. But after just the one week, he was sent to the farm in Newtown. In the meantime, on September the 15th, Thomas Mason wrote a report. And that report was endorsed by Governor Arthur and it arose from the interrogations on September the 9th, 12th and 13th of September. It was sent to the Colonial Secretary and forwarded to the Home Secretary, probably a lot arriving in London about the time Lord Russell became the Home Secretary in 1835. I haven't yet cited the full document, but have confirmed its existence in the London archives. And I've read a report from an unnamed London correspondent that was printed in the Hobart Mercury on the 24th of August, 1934 noting uh, its public release for the first time. The report suggests that the conversation may have covered more ground than Lovelace allows in victim to Wiggery. And also it appears to shift responsibility from the oath making to the London Union officials in the eyes of both Mason and Governor Arthur, uh, weakening the case against the toll puddle men in Arthur's eyes. I suggest this report was probably another reason why uh, Lord Russell had to remind Arthur, that they shouldn't interfere with uh, the outcomes of, of uh, the British courts. But the TUC book also, the 1934 book also includes part of a letter from Russell to Melbourne, where he refers to being influenced by a confession made by George Lovelace. The confession's not included or further explained, and certainly Lovelace does not mention making or writing one. And I, I think this so-called confession is Mason's report as endorsed by Arthur and I think it may well have strengthened Russell's resolve to have the men pardoned. Ironically Mason may have assisted Lovelace to get his pardon. So off to the government farm. It's a, a, a Newtown is only a few miles from Hobart town but it's a different world. It was separated from the port by Mount Stewart and a range of hills. It has two bays known as Stainforth Cove and Canelian Bay fed by rivulets running down from Mount Wellington. The very first land grants in Van Diemen's land were made on either side of the Newtown rivulet in 1804. It also held a land grant known as the Bishop's Glebe. It had the government orphanages, St John's Church, which commenced con construction the year that uh, Lovelace arrived. 
and had a number of grand homes of merchants, ship owners, colonial officials, and other wealthy people keen to escape the noise and squalor of Hobart Town. However, none of this was for George Lovelace. Initially, he, he was without a bed, as he was one of eight men sharing a hut with only five beds. So he had to wait till he rose in seniority and he found the hard lying increased his new rheumatic pains. And as he wrote, his hut was none of the best. In fine weather, we could lie in bed and view the stars. And in foul weather, we could feel the wind and the rain. His work was described by his overseer, Matthew Tobin, as shepherd and stock, keep, stock keeper to the governor on the domain farm. He described his daily toil. This description uh, refers to the spring of 1835, so some of the activities would have been seasonal. But it's clear that uh, his quite substantial role was managing the livestock, head cattle, uh, he had cows, had calves, uh, and of course he had sheep. And at, at that point in time, uh, there would have been a number of lambs newly born springing around the paddocks. And as, as he mentioned, he had to protect them from wild dogs and other things. Uh, this, this was uh, taken from the evidence that Lovelace gave to Magistrate Gunn when he was in court in November 1835. It, uh, he did write to the governor requesting assignment to a master, suggesting he wanted a change of scene, but never got a reply. He wrote very little else about his period of 12 months, which suggests that perhaps life on the government farm may not have been too bad. It's very likely that on many Sundays, he would have attended the Wesley Chapel in Hobart Town. Certainly the church historian claims so. It would have been a three mile walk taking about one hour to attend the 11 a.m. service. His early impressions of Hobart had now changed. He saw a town rising in importance and grandeur and of considerable extent. He said, the streets are wide and several are macadamized and many of the lately built shops in Elizabeth and Liverpool streets are not inferior to many in London. He also noted that his supervisor, Tobin, told him that in November 1835, the governor had started making inquiries about his character and that these inquiries continued for the next two months. Of course, Lovelace had no idea why, but uh, as we know, there was a lot happening in the background between London and Hobart at that time. On November the 3rd, Matthew Tobin decided to lay a charge of ne neglected duty against Lovelace after some cattle strayed uh, and were left overnight. He appeared before Magistrate William Gunn. Perhaps luckily, Mason was now posted out of town. In the Lovelace account, Gunn questioned Tobin at length about the work before, before deciding that the charge was the result of too many demands in his time and was not reasonable and sent him back to work. This is slightly inconsistent with the colonial record that recorded a reprimand had been issued. But for Lovelace, who was anticipating a flogging, it probably felt like an acquittal. In December, pr prisoner James Pocock was sent to the Domain Farm. As they worked together uh, for the next 12 months, Lovelace became familiar with the tale of abuse that Pocock had suffered at the hands of Thomas Mason, uh, the magistrate. Pocock was assigned on arrival uh, to Van Diemen's land to a George Woodward, who treated him badly to the extent that in an escalating series of complaints, Pocock was taken before the assistant police magistrate eight times between February and November. In something of a battle of wills, Pocock repeatedly walked off the property to be apprehended and taken before Mason, who said to him, we will see who is to, the, who is to be the master, either you, or they. He was repeatedly punished and returned to Woodward. He totaled 207 strokes of the cat of nine tails across his back and buttocks in under seven months. After the eighth punishment, he was finally taken from Woodward 
as Mason finally got the message that Woodward could not control him. This story moved Loveless. The brutality of the story moved Loveless, who wrote about it at length in Victims of Wiggery. The next event to dis disrupt his daily routine was the summons to the police office to see the principal superintendent of convicts, Josiah Spode, on December the 29th. Spode advised Loveless that he wanted to know if Loveless would like his wife and family sent out to join him. Loveless, naturally concerned that he could not support his family as a prisoner, asked if he would be a free man or not. Spode was deeply offended that Loveless had not immediately agreed and dared to question him so and sent him away with the threat of a damn good flogging ringing in his ears. It's very interesting to note that according to the register of memorandums from Governor Arthur to the colonial secretary who was Spode's boss, Arthur had instructed that a free pardon be prepared for Loveless on November the 19th, more than six weeks earlier. A week later, he was again summoned to the police office uh, and told it would be to his advantage to agree to the government offer. But Loveless stood firm on his position of not bringing his family out while he was a prisoner. He was approached a third time on January the 24th, this time by Governor Arthur himself, who came onto the farm at Newtown. After listening to Loveless's concerns, he told him he had no doubt that Loveless would receive his freedom as soon as his wife arrived and that he had sent a good character reference to London. This was a little bit duplicitous on the part of Arthur. As He'd been in possession since October the 21st of dispatches eight and 15, as well as a private and confidential instruction from Lord Glenelg that he was to give Loveless the benefit of release from servitude and that a pardon would be forthcoming. It was almost comical that the three dispatches written four weeks apart, but received at the same time in Hobart consecutively said, do it, no, you can't do it, but privately, confidentially, do it anyway. So on October the 23rd and November the 19th, he memoed the colonial secretary to prepare the pardons. And on November the 19th, he directed his private secretary to prepare a dispatch to advise the state secretary of state, Glenelg, that he had done it. So that was, that was the private instruction that he received from Lord Glenelg, telling him to give him all the benefits of the dispatch of the 12th of June, which was basically a free pass. But they were concerned that he couldn't get a ticket of leave because that would be inconsistent. So they had to come up with another way of doing it. And that, in Governor Arthur's horrible writing is the note that he wrote on the bottom of Glenelg's Dispatch 8. That says, as a note to his private secretary, acknowledge and say that George Lovers's conduct has been uniformly good and that a pardon has been granted on condition of residence. And that was the 19th of November, well before, well before the conversation about bringing the family out started. But he didn't do, he hadn't and didn't do what he'd said. Possibly his hand, that is Arthur's hand was stayed by correspondence, uh, which also came in, in a dispatch, dispatch 18, that raised the legal questions about granting exemptions before years of the seven year sentence were completed. But as I said, Glenelg was still directing Arthur to proceed and, and, and included a confidential letter to that effect. Possibly his stand with Hayde was stayed by Lord Russell's latest intervention. Lord Melbourne was desperate to calm the parliamentary debate and had to come up with the idea of sending the families to the colonies to join them in. He asked Reverend Warren, the hiring parson, to approach the wives. He reported back that Betsy Loveless was keen, but wanted confirmation from George first. So dispatch 41 of the 10th of August 1835 were duly sent to Arthur and he received it on December the 12th. And that was the dispatch uh, which 
asked him to get Lovelace's agreement to send the family out. It appears that it might have been this point that they decided to withhold the granting of the privileges of a pardon. Meanwhile, the conditional pardon was signed by King William on October the 21st, 1835, and dispatched on the 11th of November that year, but wasn't actually received in Hobart Town until 24th of May in 1836. There's no evidence that Lovelace was ever told of the existence of this conditional pardon, the condition being that he had to remain in the colony until such time as three years had passed from his arrival. Because he knew none of that, but he did know that the authorities were very keen to get his agreement and was deeply concerned of the consequences if he continued to defy them. So on January the 27th, 1836, Lovelace resolved his quandary. He decided to write to Betsy and ask her to bring the family out to join him. He sent the letter to Arthur, who on the 13th of February sent dispatch 25 back to Bunnell, enclosing that letter and advising that he had granted a ticket of exemption from all penal observance. Effectively, Lovelace had become a free man. Uh, so on February the 5th, he again was summoned to the police office and Spode issued him that ticket of exemption. He had become, as he put it, a stranger in the colony, without money, without clothes, without friends, and without a home. Because the only clothes he had were the convict uniform that he was issued, the uh, canvas trousers and the gray shirt, and a pair of shoes and a hat. He commenced to search for work by walking around the settled districts for some 50 miles without success and soon returned to Hobart town. He picked up a little work, and although, uh, Lovelace doesn't talk about this at all. I suspect probably received some assistance from the church uh, who uh, probably clothed and fed him during this period. He advertised his services and he found employment with a major Wilhelm de Galern. De Galern was Prussian by birth, but he had served in the British army, uh, particularly including the Battle of Waterloo and had married an English woman. He decided to seek his fortune in the colonies. He arrived in 1827 with a letter from Lord Bathurst guaranteeing a land grant. His first investment was a distillery on the banks of the Newtown Rivulet. However, however, his timing was poor. As shortly afterwards, the taxes on local product were increased and the import duties were decreased in an attempt to improve the quality and safety of spirits being sold. And that business failed. He was then granted land and established Glen Eyre, a property near Richmond. His, his farm was producing hay and vegetables on the fertile plains of the Coal River Valley. That ended in 1840 when he had a barn fire that destroyed his stocks and he became a government official over on the east coast uh, of Tasmania. De Glern had also had his own fight with Arthur concerning the grant of letters of denization that lasted between 1832 and 1835. Those letters would entitle him to such British privileges as government employment and land grants, but were very slow in coming. We can say, however, that their contribution to the area is not forgotten. The Glen Eyre site now contains a small subdivision where the streets have names such as Tollbuttle Drive, George Lovelace Close and the Galern Place. And as you can see, England's still sending its radicals out there. There's also a vineyard called the Tollpuddle Vineyard, makes a very fine Pinot Noir, and the cottage that uh, Lovelace lived in for most of 1836 remains intact and is now the estate office. But at the same time as Lovelace was settling into his new role, the debate in London was heating up. The debate about membership of the Orange Order was getting louder and the King's brother, the Duke of Cumberland, was being talked about in the context of having sworn an oath of membership to that organisation. Lord Russell had become determined to grant a full court pardon, but Lord Melbourne, who was, after all, one of the original conspirators in the abuse of power, was reluctant, and the King had approved of the anti-union activity. But Russell's opportunity came after a series of powerful speeches in the House of Commons from members such as Hume, O'Connell and Wakeley. And on March the 14th, 1836, Russell announced all six would receive full pardons and paid return to England. 
that full pardon was actually signed by the King on March the 10th. So Lovelace continued to work at Glenear through the winter, unaware of these events and also unaware that Betsy, knowing he had a full pardon, had advised the government on March the 18th that she was not going to Van Diemen's land. This vital piece of information was not sent forward until August 1836. Internal records show that it took five months for the Home Office to advise the Colonial Office of this, and, but they immediately dispatched advice to Arthur, but it wasn't recorded as being received in Hobart until January 1837. But to go back, imagine the feelings of George Lovelace when in early September, he sat down in the candlelight of his cottage to read the London newspapers that Major de Galerne had given him, and he found an article describing his full pardon and return to England. So if the conservative media were reporting it, did the governor know? Well, the answer is yes. Dispatch 128, dated the March, dated March the 24th, containing the full pardon and instructions from Lord Glenelg to facilitate the first favourable return, was received in Hobart Town on August the 19th. Four weeks before Lovelet, Lovelace saw it further reported in the Tasmanian Review. So there's, there's, there's the story that he saw in, in the local paper. The Lovelace waited another three weeks. In the meantime, in Sydney, the pardons had been gazetted as early as September the 6th and published in the Australian newspaper on September the 13th. But he waited another three weeks before resolving to write to the governor. And he chose to do so through the Tasmanian Review. And this letter was printed on September the 30th, where a Dorchester Unionist raised the question, has Governor Arthur received intelligence to the effect that the pardons had been granted? This achieved a quick response as the governor wrote to, to, to de Galerne to inquire if George was living with him, and if so, to tell him the governor wished to see him in Hobart Town. Unfortunately, he didn't tell George the second part, but just wrote back to the governor confirming his residence. So it was a further delay till October the 6th, when he received a letter from Josiah Spode acknowledging the free pardon. And asking if he's willing to go back. And if so, passage on the Elverstone, leaving on October the 29th, was arranged. And there happened to be the same boat that Governor Arthur, having been recalled, uh, was going home on. But George then explained that he couldn't leave because he hadn't heard from Betsy, and it would be dreadful for her to arrive and find him gone. Spode then advised that if he didn't take what was on offer, he wouldn't get a free passage home. It should be noted that the governor's instructions in dispatch 128 were to offer the first favourable passage home to Spode, uh, first favourable passage home, but Spode took the view. It was the first available passage and obstinately obstructed Lovelace's wishes. However, Lovelace persisted, and after going into Hobart Town to negotiate with Spode, the governor agreed to a delay. On December the 23rd, George received a letter from his wife saying she was not coming and she wanted him to return as soon as possible. So he instantly wrote to the colonial secretary requesting passage. Putting a timeline from these documents together, two different timings emerge as possible. Firstly, George Lovelace could have been freed from government servitude up to three months earlier than he actually was. As the instruction was received on October the 21st, but not acted on until February the next year. Secondly, his full pardon and return, signed on March the 10th, was received on August the 19th, but not even acknowledged until October the 6th. And due to the advice, delay of advisory Betsy, not acted on until January the 30th. A delay of nearly six months. At best, bureaucratic indifference, at worst, petty tyranny. But four weeks later, as he'd heard nothing, he again journeyed into Hobart Town 
where he was advised that a letter had been sent to him that day offering passage on the Everline, departing on the January the 30th. He accepted and so ended 879 days for George Lovelace in Van Diemen's Land. Well, thank you, Simon. You certainly packed a huge amount of, uh, of information into that, didn't you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> You've clearly done a lot of research as well. Uh, right. So uh, I'm sure I'm sure Nigel and I will now uh, ask you a couple of questions. Uh, the one thing that interests me, and you, you, you haven't seen the document yet, unfortunately, I was rather hoping you'd have seen it by day, is this Mason document, because it appears to me that uh, what you're describing is the government and the, uh, the local uh, enactors of the government's wishes actually uh fearing a union uprising in britain would that be would that be fair they're actually what they're saying is look the trade unions are going to rise in revolution and we want to know about that and clearly you're the man to tell us yes yes i think that's exactly uh what what we will find i mean that's how uh george lovelace reported it himself in victims of wiggery that uh and i think as i, as I mentioned the, the the long delay in, in getting all that intelligence into Hobart, meant it only had a few days to, to, to sort of work through it all before Lovelace arrived. So they perhaps saw themselves as, as being in a position to do good service for, for the empire and, and get this, this, uh, this truth out of Lovelace. But uh, as we know, that wasn't really the story. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of activity uh, and, and perhaps the uh, government feared that it was going to lead to violence, but in fact, it didn't. But uh, yes, I'm very much looking forward to getting a copy of that report to find exactly what Mason has thought and said, uh, according to the, the correspondent 100 years ago, or, or, or sorry, more than that, in, in, uh, in uh, 1934. Uh, Mason talks about a lot of questions that Lovelace didn't mention in his write up of the whole thing. Uh, and it also uh, his comments were endorsed by Arthur, suggesting perhaps that uh, the Lovelace brothers were less guilty than, uh, than Frampton and others had made them out to be. Uh, and I suspect that uh, going from that comment about uh, Lovelace May confession, uh, as reported in the TUC 1934 publication, that uh, I think this might well be the document he's referring to. That'd be interesting to see that document, won't it? Fascinating. So, Nigel, have you got some questions? A question? Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, so obviously the, the feature of uh, tonight's um, presentation is George Lovelace, but uh, is there any sign or evidence of communication with the other martyrs, either between George and them or between uh, the governor and them? Uh, there is. Um, his uncle wrote to him uh, I think it was late 1836, uh, and George was able to write back to him and advise him that uh, these pardons had been granted. Because it was more, even more complex in New South Wales because the, the five that were there had been scattered far and wide across the state. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the government in Sydney had, well, would have had to go to great effort to get in touch with them and, and, and tell them that these pardons had been granted. So Lovelace wrote to, to uh, his uncle uh, and told him that uh, this had happened and uh, hopefully that had some impact. But uh, that was the first time that he had any communication that had that occurred between them at all. Because at some point... Sorry, go on. At some point, the uh, James Hammett is something of an exception, but the other four did manage to get on the same ship coming home, didn't they? Uh, so there must have been some coordination at some point. They must have been brought together. But, uh, um... Yeah. I think that's right. That uh, once once uh, the government had got a sniff um, of the pardons in the wind, they, they had perhaps had pulled them closer into Sydney, but they were still uh, allocated to work on properties uh, at some distance from Sydney, as I understand it. But, uh, I, I must say, I, I, I followed the George Lovell story much closer than the others. Yeah. 
When, when you describe Arthur's duplicitousness uh, in not telling Lovelace about uh, these pardons, is that partly because uh, he wanted uh, Arthur to carry on working for him, or is it partly because, well, he wasn't working for him because he's working for you, weren't Is it partly then to do with uh, this, this idea of petty tyranny that you're talking about, that they, they, they still felt that Lovelace should be punished? Well, I think, I think it, it's a bit of both. He was still working on the government farm at that stage, he could have been released from there three months earlier than he was. So Arthur got the benefit of, of his work. I think also uh, Lovelace's attitude uh, upset Spode and others in that uh, he, he was um, stoic and he stood up for himself and he, he spoke plain and civil truth, uh, which they didn't like. And of course, there was some of that led to uh, that rebuke from, from uh, the Home Secretary about interfering in the, uh, in the decisions of the British courts. Uh, and, and I think uh, they also were less than happy that uh, Lovelace was going to receive a pardon. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Arthur had been questioning Tobin repeatedly about uh, Lovelace's behaviour. And I suspect he was looking for some something bad that he could put in a report back to London to, to delay the uh, pardons being granted, but uh, he couldn't because <laughs> Lovelace had behaved extra or how did they put it, unexceptionally, uh, and they had no complaint to go with him. But uh, the delay between receiving the full pardon signed by the King uh, and, 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 well, they did nothing to tell Lovelace about it at all until he discovered it in the, in the in the London papers. And then it was still, uh, what was it, six to nine weeks later that the government actually acknowledged they had this thing. And I, I, I can only, only see that as, as petty tyranny that uh, they just put it in the, in the back drawer and said, oh, he can wait, you know. Similar, I think, with the, the pardon, uh, as we saw from that register of instructions to the colonial secretary, uh, I think it was, was it November the 19th, uh, Arthur told him to prepare uh, uh, the freedom from all colonial observance. Uh, but that was put in the back pocket when they started on the uh, questioning him about Betsy Lovelace. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, when, when Lovelace asked Josiah Spode, will I be a free man uh, when, when my, if my family come out, Josiah Spode feigned great anger and, 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 and how dare you ask me a question? How dare you question me? But he had the, the uh, release in his back pocket and they decided to sit on it. So, yeah, I think there's a bit of, bit of petty tyranny in, in it as well. The, um, this idea that uh, Lovelace would, part, would be pardoned if he took up residence in Tasmania is also quite interesting because I think that's... Uh, an indicator of the government fear of uh, the power that George had, or they felt that George had, uh, perhaps mistakenly, I think. Yes, I mean, that, 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 whether it was, I mean, Lovelace was 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 ill uh, and wasn't fit to be transported, uh, and the government's very keen to get them all out of the country as quickly as they could to try and dampen down the, pro the protests. But uh, I, I suspect it was probably as much convenience as it was accidental planning that uh, they wanted to separate George from the others because they saw him a, as a leader uh, and, and a threat to them. And, and as you say, I, I think he was a gentle man of principle. <laughs> he was never going to be leading a revolution in England, was he? But uh, the way they treated him created a revolution of its own uh, and, the, and, the, and the huge upswell and I've read quite a few of the petitions that were written some of the most beautifully written documents that were sent from all over the country and, and they're all pretty much saying the same thing that the, 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 the labourers the Dorset labourers have been treated very harshly uh, and, the, and the government the king should give them a pardon which as we know he was very reluctant to do but uh, yeah. that, that is it perhaps the first the first uh, uh, peaceful campaign of the union movement in the UK to to get to get those meetings and petitions written and and, and uh, eventually achieve the result of, of a free pardon. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, Nigel. <laughs> 
I mean, I think this is, this is a wider question, maybe unfair to ask Simon, but the, um, the, the, there's a question in my mind to what extent the change of government or the change in government in the UK made a difference. Melbourne, having been the Home Secretary, now Prime Minister, um, after some switching around in politics in, in the UK, um, and, and Russell taking a somewhat different view as Home Secretary, do you get a flavour of any of that, Simon? Well, I, I think I think I do. I think uh, Lord Melbourne, uh, when he was Prime Minister, uh, was extremely reluctant to raise the issue with the King at all, because uh, the, the, earlier the King had been very much in favour of, of what Melbourne and Frampton had done. He was very anti-union, uh, and and of course there was quite a a regular turnover, something that seemed, looked like about five or six home secretaries uh, over a very short period of time. Uh, As if that would ever happen now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been true, yeah. But uh, Lord Russell, it seems to me, and, and looking at the correspondence that's available uh, between the home secretary and the colonial secretary, Russell, was really pushing to, to get them released. And it was he that pushed Lord Galil to uh, give them uh, this uh, uh, freedom from penal observance. Because uh, he, he, he decided, I think, that those pardons were, were going to be forthcoming, but uh, it still had to, uh, they had to be signed off by the king. Someone had to go to the king and say, look, you know, this has been a bit harsh. We need to fix this. And... Uh, and I think also um, there was a growing uh, campaign within the parliament itself, a number of speakers and a number of people who were bringing forward petitions and the, and the speeches. And of course, the, the crowning glory of all that was the fact that the Orange Order uh, was being publicly disposed. And the fact that these guys uh, had sworn secret oaths within the Orange Order was suddenly very inconvenient for, for the ruling class. And I think that, that probably was the, 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 the catalyst at the end of all that to, to get something done. As uh, the questions really were being asked, well, you did that to these guys. Why aren't you doing it to these guys? Who's, 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 I mean, the Orange Order was actually something of a, of a revolutionary body in itself in some ways, wasn't it? That uh, they, they were seeking to interfere with uh, the appointment of the, of the region. Yeah. A point of interest for me is uh, you said that Lovelace wrote to the governor via the Tasmanian Review. Was that was that a normal means of communication for people in, in Tasmania to write to the governor via the newspapers rather than just dropping a note in at his office or, you know, putting it in a no. post to him? I don't know what the postal system was like in Tasmania at the time, but it's, it's a very public way to write to somebody, isn't it? You know, we we get this published in the, in the pages. Yes, it was an interesting decision, and, and you can rest assured that uh, the governor would not have liked it to have, have these questions asked in such a public way. But, uh, I mean, the, the newspaper that he chose uh, was uh, run by a guy called Henry Melville, who very much was an antagonist towards Governor Arthur and his style and methods of, of, of governing. Uh, and I think he knew that he would get some assistance from that particular newspaper. Whereas if he wrote a private letter, it could well just sit in the back tray with everything else. So it was quite an aggressive move on, on his part. And, you know, you give him a thumbs up, say, well done. <laughs> well, Simon, uh, unless Nigel's got any more questions, I think we'll, we'll bring this to a close now. We're about the hour mark. So uh, thank I think you it's very much. Um, just to say, obviously, the Lovelace came home on his own landing at London and kept it quiet, didn't he? Uh, the, uh, the committee that the campaigned for their freedom uh, was asked by Lovelace not to make a fuss and to wait until the others returned, four of whom did then later arrive in Plymouth. Yes, I think that's actually a lovely little story. Though. Lo uh, Lovelace you know, got on that boat fairly quickly after it was all settled. Uh, and there's no way that any advance notice of his return would have got to England before the boat did, because any 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 uh, uh, letters or whatever would have been on that boat anyway. So he 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 gets off the boat in London 
nobody has a clue who he is until he, he walked over to the headquarters of the Dorchester Committee and announced his presence. And was, uh, you can just see the clerk falling off his chair and saying, oh my God, <laughs> you're back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. That's been a really riveting talk. I've, I've really enjoyed it. You've given us a, a new perspective on uh, Lavis's life in Tasmania. It's been great to work with you again, and I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, other people might have some questions, and perhaps if they address those questions to the uh, Southwest TUC email site, we'll, um, we'll make sure that you get those questions so you can answer them. Would that be okay with you? I'm only too happy. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, it is a great pleasure to talk about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look after yourself and we'll be in touch again soon, all right? Thank Jeez. you, Simon. Thank you, Thank you, thank you Nigel. Thank you, Simon.